Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, from wherever you're joining us, and welcome to the American Physiological Society's Roundtable Discussion on Physiology in Disease Modeling and Drug Development. I wanted to take this moment to recognize and thank Cytokinetics for this opportunity. This event would not be possible without their support. Today's discussion with our four fantastic panelists will be moderated by Dr. Dennis Brown. To kick things off, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Dennis Brown to the floor. Uh, Dennis, take it away whenever you're ready. Okay, thanks, Sarah. I'd like to welcome everybody from around the world to this round table. And uh, we're extremely happy to have four outstanding key opinion leaders in cardiovascular physiology and bioengineering to discuss their work and discuss best practices, challenges when modeling cardiomyopathies and other diseases. Um, as you'll see, we're going to talk about stem cells, engineered tissues, and other novel platforms. Um, and first of all, the presenters are going to discuss and compare their own uh, individual work, followed by a couple of discussion sessions. And we hope that you'll also at the end have plenty of questions to um, ask them. So take advantage of this opportunity to do that. So what I'm going to do is right at the outset, I'm going to invite, um, I'm going to uh, introduce all of the four speakers. And at the end of each speaker's presentation, then that speaker will lead in and uh, tag on to the next speaker. So first of all, uh, we're going to open up with Darren, Darren Hui. He's the Senior Director of Pharmacology at Cytokinetics, the sponsors of one of the sponsors of this webinar. And this is a commercial stage biopharmaceutical company that's focused on the discovery and development of novel therapeutics for the treatment of cardiac and skeletal muscle diseases. Cytokinetics are based in South San Francisco in California. So Darren received his BA in Integrative Biology from U University of California, Berkeley, and his PhD in Molecular Cellular and Integrative Physiology from uh, University of California in Davis. After Darren, we'll move on to Christine Mummery. She's a professor of developmental biology at Leiden University in the Netherlands, where she heads the induced pluripotent stem cell and organ on a chip hotel facility. Her research concerns modeling cardiovascular diseases using stem cells from patients, developing organ on a chip models for safety pharmacology and discovering disease and drug targets. Impressively, she leads a multi-million euro, I almost said multi-million dollar, but it's multi-million euro, Dutch Research Council grant for this purpose. And she co-founded the European Organ on a Chip Society, as well as the Netherlands Human Disease Modeling Technology Organization. She's currently a member of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Science and is past president of the International Society of Stem Cell Research. Our third speaker is going to be Stuart Campbell. He's an associate professor of biomedical engineering and cellular and molecular physiology at Yale. There, he heads um, a subgroup within this department called the Integrative Cardio Cardiac Biomechanics Lab. So his research currently focuses on understanding the mechanisms that underlie genetic forms of heart disease. His lab uses both computational and experimental biomechanics approaches to improve quantitative understanding of these diseases and importantly, to, involve, to evolve new therapies. And last and certainly not least is Jennifer Lewis. So Jennifer Lewis is the hans jörg Wisp Professor of Biologically Inspired Engineering at the John Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Harvard University. She is a core, a core faculty member at the uh, Wiss Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering. And both of these are located in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Jennifer has made pioneering contributions to the programmable assembly of functional, structural, and living matter, and she's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Engineering, lots of national academies here, the National Academy of Inventors, and finally the American Academy for, of Arts and Sciences. So you can see from those introductions that we have uh, four speakers with really impressive credentials to speak about this subject. So without further ado now, I'd like to hand the, the floor over to, to Darren to talk about his work. So Darren, um, you're on. Great. Thank you, Dennis. Um, again, my name is Darren Wee, uh, and I'm a Senior Director of Pharmacology at Cytokinetics. Uh, my background is in skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle physiology, and I've been an APS member for a number of years, so it's a pleasure to be able to participate in today's webinar. Um, just make sure 
screen's working here. So I'm going to skip through this actually as our mission. Uh, Dennis mentioned this, um, that uh, Cytokinetics' mission is to develop new medicines to improve the health span of people with cardiovascular and neuromuscular diseases with impaired muscle function. So uh, our collective expertise in muscle biology has led us to focus on finding uh, novel therapeutics that modulate the sarcomere, uh, which is the basic contractile unit of cardiac and skeletal muscle. And uh, for approximately 20 years now, uh, we've committed to developing small molecule modulators um, that are cardiac and skeletal muscle specific, and that modulate the actions of myosin and troponin specifically that are intended to activate or inhibit muscle contraction. And um, on the foundation of our research, we've kind of built a robust pipeline of cardiac and skeletal muscle directed therapeutics um, that are in various phases of clinical development. And we're currently looking at various uh, disease indications, um, look at heart failure, um, obstructive and non-obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and on the skeletal muscle side, looking at conditions such as ALS. So uh, a central aspect of our drug discovery efforts have been focused on you know, understanding our target uh, to improve the probability of technical success. And on the preclinical side, um, increasing the probability of technical success involves in observing a coherent and consistent response across experimental systems, and more so as the biological complexity increases. Uh, so the example here, the development of our small molecule sarcomer modulators uh, began with characterization in, in a you know, quote unquote simplified assay um, that includes the minimal components needed to see an intended effect with compounds. Um, in this example, we performed sarcomere assays that contain basic contractile proteins, mycin and actin, along with a regulatory proteins, namely the troponin complex to measure ADPase activity. And uh, if an acceptable amount of desired activity is observed that supports target engagement, we then move on to something a bit more complex and intact to see if activity tracks. In this instance, looking in the middle at an isolated cardiomyocyte or uh, a single muscle, skeletal muscle fiber. Um, and hopefully then we can make that transition from an in vitro to an in vivo system where we hope to see evidence of effect in a disease model. And uh, with the testing of a potential therapy, uh, we have the additional hurdle of making sure that whatever compound we test has adequate pharmacokinetic properties uh, to achieve a high enough and sustainable, sustainable compound level seen effect. So uh, as we progress compounds th through a program, um, we do encounter a trade-off uh, where increasing, sorry, uh, slide just jumped ahead. So uh, sorry about that. My, my screen just paused, it froze. Um, as we progress compounds through a program, uh, we do encounter a trade-off where increasing complexity of a biological system typically entails lower throughput, um, possibly from screening tens of thousands of compounds in your simplified assay in a weekly process to possibly only testing one to two compounds in a vivo system. So we've used a variety of biological systems um, that have led to the discovery of novel small molecule sarcomer modulators. Uh, among well-established systems that we've used for our discovery biology work include the use of reconstituted sarcomeres, um, permeabilized or skin muscle fibers, uh, and measures of muscle contraction from isolated cardiomyocytes, um, like an ion optic system. And uh, we've since then also incorporated the use of newer technologies, biological systems, as well as existing technologies that with each iteration has improved throughput and translation to an in vivo system. Um, so some of my fellow panel members will touch on these technologies including the use of uh, inducible pluripotent stem cells and engineered heart tissues to model genetic cardiomyopathies, um, like in our instance, looking at hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And the development and refinement of new tools have also permitted us to give a more complete characterization of a cardiac or skeletal muscle disease with or without compound in an in vitro setting, um, with examples including um, assessment of electrical activity, uh, metabolic activity, high throughput content imaging of cell morphology, uh, 
and uh, measures of target engagement by flux studies in vitro that can be followed up with an in vivo study. So when as a research team, we have an understanding of a compound in our in vitro systems, we move on to uh, in vivo assessment of a functional outcome that we hope is relevant and translatable to a patient population. So, you know, common examples of assays that we perform in healthy and diseased animal models for cardiac muscle targeted therapies include echocardiography, uh, blood pressure assessment, invasive hemodynamics, and cardiac MRI. And on the skeletal muscle side, where we study neuromuscular diseases or study conditions where muscle weakness or fatigue is a secondary symptom, um, skeletal muscle function can be characterized in a battery of assays to measure uh, performance, strength, and direct muscle force. So um, in summary, you know, there are general considerations for disease modeling and drug development, but many advances have been done. Um, so innovations have made what was once intractable muscle biology really amenable um, in a drug discovery space for ideally hit identification, lead optimization, and development. Um, and the example in this case for sarcomere directed therapies is that the knowledge of sarcomere biochemistry um, myocytes working our way to skin to intact muscle fibers to in vivo function and disease models have led to the development of novel therapeutics that are now in clinical trials. So um, something to note is that, you know, what we're talking about today as well is that challenges arise in any pursuit of addressing a biological question. And as such, uh, cardiac and skeletal muscle directed targets may require novel assays and model systems. Um, the thing that I think we'll discuss a bit, quite a bit today is that, you know, no assay or model is perfect and really knowing the limitations is vital to understanding the biological context of the results. Uh, for me personally, depending on the disease that we're studying, you know, there are major limitations in the animal models that are utilized and there is a need for complementary approaches, including new bioengineering systems that uh, my colleague will speak about in their presentation which will hopefully help generate a more comprehensive picture of the disease that we're studying and potential therapeutic approaches. Um, and then lastly, um, as we're kind of working and looking at des designing new technologies to uh, characterize the disease, um, it's the, with the understanding that much time can be really spent designing complicated assays. So kind of going back to simplicity, sometimes it's best to start simple and build complexity into downstream assays. So uh, thank you for taking the time to listen uh, to my presentation today. Um, and I'm looking forward to an engaging discussion. And now I'm happy to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Christine Mummery. I hope you can see my screen now. So I'm going to, to build uh, further on what Darren has been, talked about, has been talking about. I'm going to describe some of the models we've been developing uh, based on pluripotent stem cells. So I'm from Leiden University Medical Center, but have a second affiliation at a technical university in the east of Holland, the University of Twente. So as I said, uh, we're going to talk about uh, pluripotent stem cells, human pluripotent stem cells. And I think most of you know you can derive them from embryos as human embryonic stem cells or as iPS cells by reprogramming. What they have in common, both types of pluripotent stem cells, is they can uh, differentiate as far as we know to all cells of the body. But all of the derivatives uh, have the property that they're immature. So they resemble fetal tissue at about 16 to 20 weeks of gestation. And you can see all these cell types from different organs we can make. There are about uh, 200 different sorts in the body. But maturation is an issue in developing models. So I'm going to use cardiomyocytes as an example of how we've approached this maturation problem. So uh, these are beating cardiomyocytes derived from stem cells. And the fact that they're beating tells you they're immature because an adult cardiomyocyte would not beat without some kind of pacemaker system. Uh, there's a lack of an 3 d environment. These uh, are sheets in two dimensions. And most importantly, there's a lack of other cardiac specific cell types. And what types of cells might we think about? Well, in the heart, we have these contracting myocytes, of course. But in the adult heart, they represent only about 30% of the cells. The rest of the cells are cardiac stromal cells. Among those are endothelial cells, fibroblasts, which are actually derived from epicardial cells. And that's the layer of uh, epithelium covering the surface of the heart. 
and of course cardiomyocytes. So we asked whether these uh, additional stromal cells would benefit uh, the maturation states of the cardiomyocytes. But firstly, we need to get the uh, differentiation process efficient and reproducible. What we wanted uh, was a, a single basal medium for the differentiation of all cardiovascular cell types. And uh, we wanted to base it on small molecules to avoid uh, growth factor-based protocols, which show batch-to-batch -batch variability. And uh, we wanted to have upscaling options at reduced costs. So after a number of years, we've uh, refined these protocols. This is all um, uh, uh, published work. And we can now, by making a cardiac progenitor cells, we can derive cardiac endothelial cells, cardiomyocytes, and epicardial cells, which again lead to the formation through an epithelial to mesenchyme tradition to the formation of cardiac fibroblasts. These can be cryopreserved in large batches, which is very important. We can, and we can use these at Thor to create combinations of cells that of interest. We can do QA and QC before seeing, uh, freezing, and they're ready to use in assays. So looking for maturation, how would we actually recognize it? We can recognize it on the basis of gene expression. So the splicing of particular uh, RNAs is, is characteristic. We can see the structure of cardiomyocytes uh, might be more mature. We can look at contraction. We could look at, uh, look at the electrophysiological properties and we can look at metabolism. And in fact, all of these would have to be uh, uh, achieved. The maturation state would have to be achieved before we can actually say we have a mature cardiomyocyte. So there are many reports in the literature of how you might do this, engineered heart tissue, changing the culture reagents, ectopic gene expression, structures called biowires, 3D printing, alignment in a 2D substrate. But going back to my original premise that maybe we need the other cell types of the heart present, we decided to uh, look at, see whether we could do this in a very simple way. And what we did was take the three cell types I mentioned, the endothelial cells, cardiomyocytes and cardiac fibroblasts and took just 5,000 cells, made them as an aggregate, put in, the, in these multi-well plates and we got these uh, beating structures uh, we call micro tissue. So they're not strictly organoids uh, in the sense that are derived from a single cell, but we can control the ratio of these different cell types exactly as we want and they're highly reproducible. So the um, advantage of this method is very simple. It works well using the cryopreserved cells and it's very low, te low tech. So any lab can, can in principle do it. So what happened to the cardiomyocytes when we put them in these micro tissues? So we, if we look after about uh, 12 to 14 days, this is what we see. So this is staining for the sarcomeres. Tropin in uh, I and actin 2 staining is shown. You can see these stripes here, which are the sarcomeres. Most interestingly though, when we look at the um, ultrastructure, we see a number of very well-defined zones in the sarcomeres, but most importantly, we see these little circles in, in cross-section at the base of the sarcomeres, and these are the T-tubules. T-tubules develop, uh, develop postnatally to control calcium handling. So this is one indication that we have a fairly mature cardiomyocyte. And this is basically what these uh, micro tissues uh, look like. The red are the uh, endothelial cells, the fibroblasts are unstained, uh, and the cardiomyocytes are in green. So they form these aligned structures. These are not vascularized as such. There's no lumen in these vessels, but I'll get back to that later. Um, what I don't have time to show you is aside from the structural maturation, we have electrical maturation, mechanical maturation, and metabolic maturation. Most importantly, these uh, micro tissues are very inexpensive. So they cost just $25, uh, sorry, $25 cents per micro tissue, which is within the boundaries uh, pharma finds acceptable. Um, what is interesting for us as academics is we can do multi-lineage cardiac disease modeling. And what I mean by that is we can replace any of these three cell types by one carrying a mutation relevant for patients and we can figure out which cell is actually causing a phenotype. So I'm going to give you an example of that particular uh, use, and I'm give, actually, going to give you actually uh, four potential uses of these lines. So the first disease I'm going to discuss is arrhythmic, uh, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, ACM. 
This is caused by mutations in the desmosomal protein PKP2. It's characterized in patients by arrhythmias and fibrofatty replacement of the myocardium. The cell of origin is actually unknown, but it's been postulated that the cardiac fibroblasts may be causal. So uh, what we decided to do was to replace the cardiac fibroblasts in those micro tissues I showed you with uh, those that isogenically just containing the PKP2 mutation. So this is basically what we see. The cardiomyocytes in these micro tissues are normal and only the cardiac fibroblasts have the mutation. What we're seeing here is staining for connexin 43. You can see it in the control on the left here. On the right, the cardiac fibroblasts with the mutation show very much reduced um, uh, uh, marking of uh, connexin 43. But strikingly, when we paste these cardiac micro tissues is where we see the striking di uh, differences. So at one hertz, everything looks perfectly normal. At two hertz, we're beginning to have difficulty with the cardiac micro tissues containing the mutant cardiac fibroblasts uh, following the pacing rate. And at three hertz, we get these very striking arrhythmias. So what we're showing here is actually the cardiac fibroblasts are one of the culprits in ACM. Cardiomyocytes are, uh, are perfectly uh, normal. And in fact, the desmosomal proteins are brought or co-transport into the membrane by connexin 43. Another application. This is in the, uh, in the cardiotoxicity. To cardi uh, uh, the drug called um, doxorubicin is used to treat cancer. It's still the only drug useful for osteosarcoma in, in children, and it's used in many cases to treat breast cancer. But many patients develop irreversible heart failure within two to, 20, to, to 10 years, and the only treatment is actually um, a heart transplant. So in our control micro tissues, we can see them here with vectorology. We can see on the right here, uh, contraction and relaxation. It's in, in a vector diagram. And if we add doxorubicin, we see here an enormous uh, reduction in the contractility of the micro tissues. Now, a very clever medicinal chemist, a colleague of mine in Leiden, has uh, developed variants on doxorubicin, chemical variants, in which he's uh, separated two activities. He's distinguished the DNA damage um, activity from the histone eviction. And it turns out that these uh, various um, uh, variants of uh, doxyrubicin, um, some of them have effects on the heart and some don't, but all of them uh, affect the tumor. And this is what we could see very clearly in our model. Here is a control amplitude of contraction, doxyrubicin greatly reduced, when we have this dimethyl doxyrubicin or aclorubicin, there's very little um, effect on toxicity of the heart, but it still um, kills the tumor cells. And this aclorubicin is actually being moved forward into the clinic, correlates exactly with what you see in mouse models, but much quicker, and we know it's true for humans. Another mo model. I said that uh, splice variance uh, expression was important uh, an important difference between fetal and adult uh, tissue. The sodium uh, ion channel, SCN5A, has actually two splice variants, 6A uh, in the 6A and 6B exons. So in the um, fetal tissue, the 6A variant uh, is expressed, but at birth, that's uh, decreased and the 6B splice variant is expressed. So if we want to model a cardiac disease in adults caused by a mutation in the 6B variant, we would have to find some way to mature them. And this is exactly what we did. There was a family in which the father and the mother had mutations in these exons. The mother had a, a mutation in exon 6B. Both of the parents were asymptomatic, but two of the children died when they inherited both mutations. So when we looked uh, at the sodium currents, you can see that here, this is the uh, disease line. You can see it's much lower than the blue line, which is a control. But when we had the heterozygous, we could see no difference. So the heterozygous and the double mutation had the same effect in 2D. But when we go to 3D micro tissues, this uh, 6B uh, variant is expressed. The mutation is evident. And we can see here, we can reveal the phenotype of um, the uh, children 
with this mutation. So what we're saying is that the uh, fetal variant uh, can be expressed in the micro, sorry, the, um, the postnatal phenotype can be expressed in the micro tissues. We found out this particular gene, muscle blind like splicing regulator one, controlled this. And we could also control how the muscle uh, splice variants are expressed. Another use, and this is um, among my final uses, this is uh, a micro tissue model. This is a high throughput robotic system looking at calcium uh, um, excitation, excitation. You can see it here, one of these micro tissues with a, um, a dye for calcium. You can see the micro tissues are flashing here. We put in a Haramatsu, Haramatsu uh, method uh, or robot to uh, measure the calcium signals. And you can see here the kind of things we measure. So this is an arrhythmia, that's bad. And this is the regular beating, which is good. We looked at a disease um, called CPVT caused by mutations in the ryanodin receptor, which regulates uh, calcium um, handling in the, in the cells. You can see it here it's very regular. We give it a trigger, this uh, mutant line. You can see these um, arrhythmias appearing. And this is very unusual. We normally are unable to see the, the arrhythmias caused by this, this mutation in cardiomyocytes in 2D. And we hardly ever see uh, the effects of a drug called flecainide. And you can see here in this model, we can see it extremely clearly. So this means we finally have a model to look at CPPT uh, mutations and to screen for drugs. And in the future, what we expect to be able to see is classifying these patients who do or do not um, respond to flecainide and be able to de decide which patients are likely to respond to the drugs and which do not, and also to design alternatives for the drugs that uh, do not work in some patients. So just to summarize what I've said, I've showed you a low tech, scalable and inexpensive model to study cardiac disease and toxicity based on mature cardiomyocytes, not fully adult, but certainly postnatal. The multi-cell type model allows identification of cellular targets in cardiac disease. So we can see which cells are likely to cause the disease. And many IPS and organoid models are actually ready to go for drug repurposing and screening for therapeutic targets. Finally, I'll close with the people who are driving this work in my lab, Elena Berlin, Richard Davis, and Valeria Olova are junior group leaders. We have a IPS core facility. We have multiple funders and we work with a number of companies uh, to get some of the technology uh, out there for use. And now I'd like to um, in, uh, introduce uh, Stuart Campbell from Yale, who's going to be the next presenter. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be here and uh, want to thank APS and, and Cytokinetics, Darren, uh, for the opportunity to present today. I'm an associate professor of biomedical engineering at Yale University. And um, I'm delighted to, to share with you a little bit about engineered human myocardial strips for disease modeling and therapy development and kind of build on some of the themes that um, have already been discussed today. One disclosure, I am the founder of uh, Propria LLC, which has licensed some of the technology you'll see today. Uh, I'll mention that just at the end. So my lab um, several years ago when I began at Yale was interested in studying hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And with some of our clinical partners, we had um, access to cardiomyopathy patients, and including the possibility of generating IPS cell lines from them. And of course, we were aware of the, the potential that's, uh, that Christine was already discussing of differentiating these um, IPSCs into cardiomyocytes. The question we had is, how could we do muscle physiology? I had a, an extensive background and training in muscle mechanics and physiology, and I wanted to be able to do some of those same traditional measurements, but with patient specific cells. And the approach that we evolved was to actually make use of a donor heart, porcine heart typically, where we will cut a block from that heart, cryosection it to 100 microns thick, and then orient a, a laser cutter to cut out a pattern such that we could have a, um, a ribbon-like structure where the fibers of the heart were oriented left to right as shown here uh, in this cartoon. From there, we could use a, a chemical uh, treatment to decellularize that strip of, of myocardium and be left with primarily the native collagen. 
From there, we could seed IPS cardiomyocytes into um, this tissue scaffold held inside of a device that would make it amenable for uh, cell seeding and later for measurements and, and further analysis. So um, this approach we found over time holds several uh, key features that are advantages. Uh, the first is that um, with this ribbon-like structure and, um, and thin dimension sort of in, in cross-section, it's ideal for um, nutrient exchange and also for diffusing things in that you might want to study in the tissue, such as small molecules, or even delivering viral particles or other things um, into that tissue. Furthermore, uh, Christine was mentioning maturation of cardiomyocytes, and I'll show you on the next slide. Uh, we have a lot of evidence that this adult myocardial matrix enables um, maturation along several key um, facets that, that have already been mentioned here as well. Finally, uh, by attaching firmly the scaffold to either end of, of our, uh, our device in these plastic clips, it's possible to perform true isometric contraction measurements. And we can also uh, stretch or slacken the tissue by moving one end. You can see one end of our, our tissues can be attached to a linear actuator. Uh, that enables more physiology, such as measuring the length dependent activation or the Frank Starling behavior of these tissues while um, getting high resolution recordings of their uh, twitch force. And uh, because we can do this, we have a, a force transducer attached to these tissues, it's possible to, to monitor the output or behavior of the tissue in real time. And I'll mention later um, the advantages that accrue from that. So <clears throat> just an overview of, of some of the characterization that we've done over the years. These tissues form uh, beautiful uh, aligned cardiomyocytes with well-defined sarcomeres. Because of that structural maturation, they have realistic Frank Starling behavior, like dependent activation, as I already mentioned. We also find that the isometric twitch time course is very comparable to adult ventricular trabeculae that have been reported in the literature. And a large part of this we find is <clears throat> due to the fact that um, the ratio of alpha and beta myosin heavy chain is, is realistic in these preparations. We're able to load these with uh, voltage sensitive dyes, calcium sensitive dyes to record um, action potentials and, and calcium transients as well. So we find that uh, this is a platform with a lot of different applications and through a series of publications over the years, we've explored some of these that I'll share today, but um, uh, we are able to introduce different types of IPS cardiomyocytes into these tissue scaffolds. So we have done patient specific cell lines for modeling specific diseases. We've also been able to leverage CRISPR-Cas9 technology to engineer in uh, mutations of interest into the system. Once the tissues are formed and matured for a few weeks, we can then uh, perform characterization. So it's it's been a good platform for disease modeling. Uh, more recently, we've found that uh, we can diffuse viral particles into these EHTs and get good uh, even transfection um, of a, a payload of interest in there. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is also ideal for testing small molecules, both acute and chronic effects because they diffuse easily into this tissue. So in uh, the few minutes I have remaining, I'll give you a quick example of, of each of these. A few years ago, we uh, got interested in looking at, at myosin binding protein C mutations, which are um, a main cause of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, inherited um, cardiac disorder. In this slide, I'll refer to the, this um, as a truncating C-protein mutation, TCM. We developed an IPS line from an HCM patient with one of these truncating mutations and um, performed tests on a control IPS line uh, with cardiomyocytes placed into our scaffold. And, and this is an example of, of that uh, control twitch. So this was from a sibling and characterized the time to peak and uh, relaxation rate from these tissues. And then we were able to look at engineered heart tissues made from, uh, from the, the TCM patient themselves. And as you can see, it, it looks like we have a delay in the relaxation time. This was uh, confirmed statistically, so we have a, a good indication uh, of this phenotype. There was a slight tendency towards an increased 
force, uh, peak force per cross-sectional area that wasn't quite significant. But uh, we proceeded to look at the length dependent behavior of these tissues to see if there might also be an HCM phenotype uh, manifest there. So in these experiments, we pace the tissues uh, typically at one hertz and then perform a slow stretch up to 10% of the culture length of the tissue. And we can then extract the height of these peaks. So the uh, in between what we would call the diastolic force uh, versus the systolic force. Here's that Frank Starling response that we expect to see. And in the patient EHTs, we can observe that this behavior was significantly blunted. And so it, it seems that the contractile reserve in these HCM tissues is also reduced. Furthermore, we can look at the passive characteristics, the non-contractile portion of this curve, and we observe that it was uh, more than twice as stiff in, in the truncating C-protein uh, mutation patient EHTs. This is interesting, of course, because one of the clinical hallmarks of HCM is fibrosis. And so even in this tissue that's just a few weeks old, we're already seeing um, a stiffer tissue. This seemed to be um, explained, at least in part, by an enhanced secretion of collagen in the conditioned media. And I didn't mention this, but I should that we co-culture our IPS cardiomyocytes with 10% primary human cardiac fibroblasts. And so the uh, fibroblasts in these uh, constructs are apparently activated by the uh, patient cells. We've repeated this with patient-derived lines uh, for a few other HCM mutations, including this one to tropomyosin E192K, and also in a myosin heavy chain mutation. And as you can see in each case, the uh, patient cell lines from HCM patients exhibit this prolonged uh, contraction. So it, it seems to hint strongly at a, a common phenotype amongst um, patient-derived cell lines with HCM. So to shift gears a little bit, uh, but continuing in the vein of examining uh, myofilament proteins, we have been able to uh, use our um, engineered heart tissue platform to express adenoviral vectors uh, carrying mutations to myofilaments and then uh, look at the attendant characteristics. And I'll just move through this really quickly. This mutation, tropomyosin uh, M8R, is associated with dilated cardiomyopathy. And you can see here that the introduction of M8R with an adenoviral vector blunts the uh, contractility and had a significant decrease in the normalized force time integral and uh, sped up relaxation, in essence, uh, blunting the, the duration of that twitch. Finally, and I'll, I'll move through this quickly, um, we have done quite a bit of work on characterizing small molecules that, that target the sarcomere. Darren mentioned some of those in his talk. Um, what we're able to do is to flow uh, a drug through an, an inflow syringe um, across the tissue while we're pacing and uh, measuring force. And we still, of course, have the opportunity to stretch the tissue. What we do is just swap out syringes with um, increasingly uh, increasing drug concentrations. It's important to note that uh, we can do an hour and a half study to two hour studies measuring the peak force of this engineered heart tissue. And you can see that there's essentially no functional rundown across uh, that sham experiment. And so what I'll show you in the next slide is um, during this same sort of hour and a half interval, swapping in higher concentrations of the drug omecanthid macarbol, for instance, so this plots the peak force here in blue. You can see with increasing concentrations, you can watch that drug diffuse in and uh, alter, alter contractility. And we also examined Danacamptid, which is another myosin activator uh, that's, that's in uh, clinical trials right now. You can see uh, similar behavior with enhancing contractility over time. At the same time, we can look at the effect of these drugs on relaxation and understand um, how, they, how these two properties relate to each other, the uh, inotropic event, effect versus the, the lucitropic effect. We can also look at how these drugs affect the Frank Starling behavior. So we did something very similar to uh, the way we characterized that HCM patient I showed earlier. So we chose the EC50 values for these two compounds, um, 0.5 micromolar and one micromolar respectively for omecamptive and denacamptive. And then looked at, at uh, this slow stretch response. 
And uh, that's what I'm showing here, the, the peak force at several different stretch values. Black is baseline. And what's interesting is you can see in this view that both compounds are elevating contractility, but that omecanthin preferentially increases contractility at shorter sarcomere lengths. Danacamptive does not seem to do much uh, at shorter sarcomere lengths, but then its effect is enhanced with stretch. So we feel that this uh, method of being able to uh, change the preload on these tissues exposes some interesting physiological consequences of, of different inotropes. So I think I'll, I'll wrap up there. Um, we are seeing a lot of exciting applications for this in vitro technology while also acknowledging um, you know, the need to continue to, to push maturation and uh, improve that aspect of, of the technology. So I'll thank the current and former members of my lab, all of whom contributed greatly to this work. I think we're gonna have a minute in the round table to talk about industry academic partnerships. Um, I decided a few years ago, uh, the way I would pursue that, that was um, by working to license some of our technology and we've been successful at doing this. Um, I founded Propria Bio uh, a few years ago and uh, we have several active collaborations that uh, are enabling us to release some of this technology out into, um, into industry. And uh, with that, I will wrap up. And I'm happy to introduce our, our final speaker, uh, Dr. Jennifer Lewis. So thank you so much, Stuart. It's a pleasure to have this opportunity to describe some of the work that we've been doing to engineer cardiac tissues for both drug testing and therapeutic repair. Uh, I'll begin just with a brief um, mention of disclosures and funding for our lab. This is actually a broad uh, uh, laboratory effort, so the funding here goes beyond our cardiac tissue work. Um, and from the perspective of, of co-founding and scientific advisory boards, um, none of the companies are focused on cardiac tissue uh, or, or drug discovery based on our cardiac tissue models. So we've been focusing on using biomanufacturing to create human tissues, both microphysiological systems, such as the work that I'll describe today, which focuses on instrumenting uh, hard-on-a-chip models, as well as trying to create more uh, complex three-dimensional um, cardiac tissues with the ultimate goal of organ engineering, but also I believe these have uh, relevance for addressing some of the, uh, you know, discussions that, that Darren made with respect to the fact that as pharma considers whether to do high throughput for initial screening, but ultimately move certain drug targets towards more complex models prior to using animal models, these 3D tissues could be quite relevant. Um, and here we use cardiac uh, building blocks, much like uh, Dr. Mummery described, um, but we then take these uh, building blocks and we assemble them into a vascularized bulk construct using a process that we describe as SWIFT biomanufacturing, where SWIFT stands for sacrificial writing in functional tissue. So I'll begin with just a brief overview of our work in the instrumented uh, heart on a chip model. And this is work that we carried out in close collaboration with Kit Parker's lab at Harvard. And uh, he had already developed an, a model based on uh, seeding uh, cardiomyocytes onto a cantilever, um, but he was using uh, at the time an optical readout method, which is cumbersome. And so he came to our lab to think about how could we uh, directly embed within these cantilevers a um, electrical readout component, in this case, this U-shaped strain sensor. And so we used our expertise in multi-material 3D printing to create such a device. So what you're seeing here is a sequence of different materials being uh, co-printed with different, each, each of these layers has a different function. And so uh, as you saw, as this chip builds up, we have at the end of the day, eight individual wells. And within those wells, um, the first thing we have is a release layer that allows the cantilevers to be detached we then print down this um, strain sensor. And then what you're seeing here is a layer that guides the cardiomyocytes to create an aligned tissue. And then ultimately PDMS wells that hold the media within each of these uh, 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 reservoirs. 
So as I said, this tissue guiding layer is quite important. And we went through uh, several experiments to optimize the um, center to center spacing of these ridge lines. And at this appropriate spacing of 60 microns, you can see that a, a very nice aligned cardiac tissue arises um, after we seed uh, this top layer with uh, induced pluripotent derived cardiomyocytes. Um, we can then use this electrical readout property, again, using the strain sensor that's embedded within the cantilever flap. So this is embedded underneath the, the cardiac tissue, but not in direct contact. So it's at the midplane of this uh, cantilever to directly read out the contractile stress. And we can take that readout to convert this into a stress as shown here. And of course, also at the same time, uh, sample this as a function of the beat rate. So um, as, as Dr. Mumry uh, mentioned, these induced pluripotent cardiomyocytes are really representative of an immature cell type. But when they are assembled into a micro tissue and seeded onto these cantilevers and formed into an aligned layer, um, they do both exhibit improved alignment and maturation over a four week period. And this is evidenced not only by the uh, amino staining here, which shows the enhanced uh, sarcomeric machinery, but also the fact that the contractile stress increases dramatically uh, from day two to day 28 over the, as these uh, tissue layers uh, mature and as their alignment improves. So we can use these, um, you know, cardiac uh, uh, layers or this heart on a chip model to uh, evaluate cardioeffective drug response. And this is just one example of, of dosing with a dose response curve for verapamil, which is a calcium channel blocker. And this uh, drug acts to both uh, influence calcium ion channels within the cardiomyocytes, but also uh, between uh, the intercellular junctions. And as you can see here, this is a normalized stress. So this is the contractile stress measured at a given time or a given dosage, if you will, uh, minus the minimum stress, uh, normalized by the maximum to minimum difference. So uh, in the absence of the drug, we would expect this normalized stress to be one. And as we increase the uh, dose uh, of this uh, drug, we see a pronounced uh, decrease uh, in the uh, contractile stress as we block more and more of the calcium uh, channels. So as we kind of think about further enhancing the complexity of these models, um, we want to move towards these three-dimensional perfusible uh, cardiac tissues. And as I said, we use a process known as a swift biomanufacturing to achieve this. And we started with a protocol to develop these um, uh, bio blocks or building blocks, if you will, which are essentially multicellular aggregates of, of human induced pluripotent uh, stem cell derived cardiomyocytes. And we followed a protocol published in the literature from Sean Palasik's group at Wisconsin. Um, and so this starts with these um, uh, human uh, uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. Those are then aggregated into embryoid bodies, and then they're differentiated into cardiomyocytes. And as uh, Dr. Mumry uh, explained, uh, because of their immaturity, each one of these individual building blocks or bio blocks, if you will, beats, but they're beating asynchron asynchronously here. Each one of them is, is beating sort of to their own drum, if you will. But when we take these tissues, uh, in this case, we're now just using the embryoid bodies themselves in the pre-differentiated stage, we can jam them into a dense matrix and that allows us to embed within the dense uh, tissue matrix these um, uh, channels, if you will. So what we're actually printing here is a sacrificial ink and everything that you see in red eventually gets erased and leaves behind these open lumens. And so you can see that very nicely in this tissue. And, and, and absent these uh, embedded channels, uh, the tissue would die. Because if we look at this, this is about 2.5 milliliters uh, of, of the tissue. It contains about a half a billion cells at a cell density that's akin to physiologically relevant cell densities, in this case, 200 million cells per milliliter. So, but with these pervasive channels that run and that we've printed 
within this uh, tissue, we can now, if you look at this live dead assay, essentially everything shown in green is, is a living cell. So even the uh, building blocks deep within the tissue uh, receive enough nutrients via perfusion through the, and, and then diffusion uh, through these channels. So um, if we look at this, uh, these are the cardiac bioblocks that we've actually uh, created and assembled here. And I'll, I'll show this movie. You can see that by day eight, this tissue is now beating synchronously. So all of these building blocks have fused together. And I should point out in these, in these bio blocks, we have a combination of the cardiomyocytes along with, in this case, human um, uh, fibroblasts and Hubex. I really like the protocol that uh, Dr. Mummery uh, presented earlier, where all of the so cells would be derived from the initial uh, stem cell source. And that's something that we're, uh, that's currently underway in our lab. But for this initial work, we uh, just use the uh, stem cell derived cardiomyocytes and combine them with um, these cell types. And so you can see uh, in each of the building blocks, we do have evidence of these, um, you know, uh, microvascular features. Um, again, they may not be luminized as, as was earlier described, but you can also see this, this beautiful um, sarcomeric uh, constituents that give rise to this contractility. Now, as I mentioned, on day one, when we just first compact the tissue and write the channels and, and erase to leave behind the, um, the perfusible channels, we have these individual uh, cardiac building blocks that are beating asynchronously. And you can see here in a time-lapse fl fluorescence imaging where we're using a calcium indicator that there are very many regions within the tissue that are, that are beating asynchronously. However, after this tissue uh, matures and these individual building blocks fuse together, we do get, in fact, a synchronous uh, synchronization across the entire tissue. And, and this is what happens uh, under sort of a spontaneous non-paced uh, uh, response. And so we can also use these tissues to evaluate cardioeffective drug response, where now the drugs, rather than just being the tissue just being bathed in these drugs and diffusing through the tissue, we're actually delivering these drugs uh, through the uh, microvascular uh, or the vascular channels that we've printed with deep within the tissue. And so you can see in the presence of, of, of a drug that's used to uh, enhance the um, beat frequency, that in fact, we do in fact see that type of response. And then in another drug, which is used to suppress the contractility, again, we see that kind of uh, response. Um, and this really just forms a baseline, if you will, for the types of, of tissues that one can create um, and as others have described today, one can use uh, different cell types um, or, or different donor patients that might already have disease to create disease models. These are, of course, much more complex than the building blocks themselves. But we think that in some cases, um, being able to get closer to a three-dimensional microphysiological environment that's perfusible has merit for uh, both disease modeling and drug toxicity testing. Now, beyond um, our, our work in cardiac tissue, we've also been applying these same tools to generate uh, vascularized kidney tissues as well as neural tissue. And our focus has really been to place tissue function at the heart of our engineering processes. Um, so I'll just conclude by acknowledging, again, uh, contributors to this work, both past and present. And particularly, I'd like to highlight um, Mark Schuyler Scott, who's now a faculty member at Stanford, and Seb Uzel, who really led our SWIFT uh, uh, printing work, and others shown here that have made uh, valuable contributions. Um, so with that, I'll end, and I'll turn it back over to uh, Dennis Brown. Well, I'm sure you'll agree that, that were, they were four uh, outstanding presentations, and I think we've uh, all got quite a lot of uh, questions to ask, but unfortunately we don't have a great deal of time, so we'll try and um, touch on some of these questions in the, in the discussion. And um, I, get, I guess that a, a question to everybody here on the, on the panel, you, you've all talked about the benefits of this, and obviously I think the benefits are visible. You've also all, uh, talked about some of the issues and problems that, that we're facing. And so I'd just like to go around the table and ask everybody, you know, to be, 
uh, Frank, about what, what is the biggest obstacle that you're looking at right now to pushing this work forward? Um, and how do you think that that can be resolved? What resources do we need to resolve that? So um, I, I'm just looking at, at, at the screen here and I'm seeing uh, Dr. Mummery on the top left. So I'll start with you. So obstacles. Yeah, I think I think uh, one of the, the things is we still need to go further in the maturation process. We, uh, we do have many methods now um, to get uh, early postnatal cells, but they're not really adults and we can't mim um, uh, mimic aging. So we'd like to be able to see aging. We'd like to be able to see fibrosis a little bit better. So some of the more general conditions. So we're good at genetic models. I think, and we have mm -hmm. lots of readouts for that. I would say it's almost a done deal for toxic, toxic, uh, toxicity studies, mm -hmm. but we can still go further with uh, creating models for drugs in disease modeling. Okay, Dr. Campbell, what's, uh, what's bugging you? Yeah, th this is of course the, perhaps the central question um, beyond what <clears throat> Dr. Mummery has already mentioned something that I think is an interesting challenge is, is the um, achieving an appropriate cell size. Cardiomyocytes in the adult tissue are much larger than what we obtain with IPS um, differentiations. And so how do we take those constructs through a process that might mimic what happens in fetal development and, and uh, neonatal development? And so I think there's, um, there's definitely a role for mechanical loading and and um, you know, being more creative with constructs, but I suspect in that process, we'll be able to get further down the road of maturation of calcium handling, calcium handling structures, uh, metabolic maturation, and and so forth. So that that's just what, one of the paradigms that that I think of when I consider maturation. Dr. Lewis. Yeah, I mean, I would amplify <laughs> the the need for more maturation. Um, I would also say, I think what, what we've heard today are sort of a minimum a number of cell types needed to recapitulate uh, cardiac function. The adult heart has, I think, 17 different cell types, according to the Cell Atlas paper, this beautiful Cell Atlas paper that came out uh, maybe a year or so ago. And so the question is, what what is that minimum number of cell types? How do we embed, say, a conductive network? Um, as we as we start to mature these these tissues more, as, as Dr. Mumray said, we need that that uh, cardiac conduction system as well. So that's some some of the things that we're thinking about. Um, and 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 obviously, uh, you know, just in, in ever reducing the costs of and and the scale and throughput of the actual cell source. Um, so how do we, you know, enhance these differentiation protocols using things like bioreactors from an engineering perspective, we need quite large volumes of tissue if we want to, you know, replicate, uh, you know, sort of organ scale uh, uh, tissue con constructs. Absolutely. Yeah, just to, and, add, uh, just to uh, add on to that, perhaps um, getting the vasculature to be luminized by coupling it to microfluidics is, is a challenge. Um, but I think we're getting there in many, many labs now. Also adding the inflammatory cells, the macrophages, doing it preferably mm -hmm. isogenically with the iPS cells. There are many different combinations of cells we can now add in to figure out what's going on. That's great. So, Dr. Wee? Yeah, no, I, I'm just kind of speaking from integrating this into um, our drug development screening process. Um, I think as all three of the pa other panel members have touched on, um, it's considering the current conditions, it's, it's an ongoing activity to optimize. So for us is to kind of understand the context for what we're currently looking at in that experimental system um, and kind of using that as another platform to interpret how the disease looks. And then if we were to test a therapeutic, um, what does that all mean when we throw this into an animal afterwards and test it there? In, in, in terms of the um, of, of, of the, the drug testing capabilities of, of all of these systems, really, we all know of the discussions that have been going on about the use of mice and the failure rate in human trials. Um, is it worth pursuing these systems in, in, in rodents or should we focus exclusively on human cells? Anybody? I would say for the heart, it's really worth investing in the human cells. Um, there are some, let's say, developmental conditions. If you want to understand what a gene uh, or a drug does in development, you might consider using a mouse. Uh, 
Um, but if you take many other conditions, the human heart is increasingly shown to be different from rodents. And mm -hmm. um, it's going to be, there's so many misses, drugs still going into the clinic um, that, that kill people because they haven't been detected uh, as a problem in, in the rodent models. Um, maybe not even in dogs. So I, I think we're getting closer and closer. But what we do need is these head-to-head -head comparisons and proper lists of drugs that have been missed uh, in the, for their risk has been missed in going forward to the clinic and finding somebody to manufacture them so that we can test them in our systems. It's really hard to get a uh, hold of drugs that have not made it to the clinic for cardiotoxic reasons. Right. Yeah, I mean, else say, want to yeah, I mean, I'd say it, it really does depend on, on the target that we're studying and how well we think using the experimental system that we have, it will translate to humans. Um, I'd say there's mm -hmm. definitely some major pitfalls with some of the diseases that we've looked at in animals that don't translate well at all and um, both pose efficacy and safety concerns that we don't find out, unfortunately, until down the road. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly, it's uh, for me, I just kind of look at it as all the available resources we have in our toolbox, and we should use the ones that we think is appropriate for that target. Sure. Anybody else, uh, Stuart or Jennifer, like to add to that or? I think that's been, yeah. those are good, good responses. Yeah. Okay, so, so um, I think that we've, we've talked about drug testing a little. Um, is there anything in the future that would lead you to think that these would be useful for, for diagnosis, uh, for diagnostic purposes that could be approved for, in the clinic for diagnosis, taking a patient sample and, and, and testing multiple drugs or, or, or looking for uh, effects that might not be obvious um, or might not even be possible to do in the whole organism, in the whole person. So can you diagnostic? Um, I, I think we're feeling yeah. already that, um, uh, you know, stratifying patients is getting there. So what we're beginning mm -hmm. to see is patients with severe disease, uh, their, their cardiomyocytes are actually showing a stronger phenotype than people with mild disease or no disease at all. And there's mm -hmm. some work uh, clearly showing if you delete the healthy allele, you can reveal the mutant phenotype much better. So this um, helping decide which patient will need an implanted device, which won't, um, then that can be very helpful. And if we know who's at risk, that will make a great deal of difference to who we're going to treat. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thoughts on diagnosis? <laughs> I, I think the diagnostic question is really exciting. And particularly in the context of inherited cardiomyopathies, there's um, roughly half of all families don't have a good genetic signature. And mm -hmm. so um, clinicians are searching for alternative ways of stratifying risk in those families. And, um, you know, my lab has dedicated quite a bit of time to, to trying to uncover these phenotypes that might be seen. Uh, through the development of patient-specific IPS lines. And as, as uh, Dr. Mumry mentioned, there, there's some confidence that those could be very sensitive assays. So I think that's an exciting area of growth for, for this entire field of, of 3D tissues and IPS cardiomyocytes. Yeah, I agree. Is, is there... Go ahead. No, I, I don't have anything to add, but I definitely agree with what's been said. Yeah, especially so, now so we can any... uh, now we can engineer upstream mutations or variants. Mm -hmm. um, just putting different variants uh, ahead or in front of or behind a particular mutation is proving very informative. And then we can mm -hmm. finally, in humans, say um, why some patients are vulnerable to getting a condition and others. We'd never be able to discover that in mice. Mm -hmm. Is is there any possibility of taking? mature um, adult, let's say, cardiomyocytes and de-differentiating them and to avoid a, a little bit so they may end up in a place that's more advanced than an, IS, than an induced pluripotent stem cell. So um, de-differentiation and then re-differentiation, is that, is that something that's, that you're doing? Anybody? I'm thinking of the repair mechanism after ischemic injury yeah. in, in a heart. Yeah, I, I don't think many, I think people who are studying uh, the re, you know, reformation of sarcomeres after division, mm -hmm. uh, that's an mm -hmm. area which is very interesting um, and it may have therapeutic benefit because if you're going to make a cardiomyocyte divide, 
after myocardial infarction, let's say, do that, try that in adults. It has to de-differentiate, but it has to reassemble its sarcomeres. So it's going to need a lot of basic uh, research to figure out how that works and how you might enhance mm -hmm. it. I think generally mm -hmm. when, when cells are de-differentiated, it's hard to get them to reform their contractile apparatus right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one that kind of moves into the zone of politics, I guess, a little bit of question is, I think on December the 22nd, just before um, the Christmas holiday, there was uh, the FDA now are not required to, uh, to validate drugs based on animal experimentation. Um, any thoughts on the perils and the advantages of that appro approach? Um, obviously, the animal rights activists are overjoyed about this. Um, other people are not so much overjoyed. So what about the legislation now that doesn't require the FDA to demand animal experimentation for drug approval? Um, it may be different, Christine, in, in, in the Netherlands. I don't know how, how you're following the US lead here. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's certainly the same in Europe. I think the movement against animal experiments is higher, but we shouldn't be sort of blinded um, by the movement, we have to get drugs that are safe and effective on the market, and it, it should be whatever it takes. So if you're looking at a drug that affects behavior, the chance of being able to do that in a, in a, in a you know, cell model is a really rather slim at the moment. But if you're looking at something has a very specific pharmacological effect, I think it's quite possible. And I think the first drug has now been brought to market with approval without mm -hmm. any uh, animal experiments. Um, mm -hmm. I think Sanofi did that in May last year. So, mm -hmm. you know, th this is coming through. There are other companies working on that. Sorry, my mm -hmm. dog is wanting to join this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other, any thoughts on that? Um, Stuart, any thoughts? I'm picking on you. Oops, he's gone. I was just going to say, if, if I might on that topic, I, I think whether we're talking about maturation or the way that these are these technology platforms are used for drug development or approval, um, as Christine was saying, that probably the most important thing we could do is to try to define clear objectives and um, you know purposes for the different things that we're doing. So um, if we waited, you know, Darren, you mentioned that none of these models are perfect. And so we've spent a lot of time trying to carefully select the applications um, and the, the sort of criteria that we're interested in and then design uh, to those criteria, right? And, and try to perform validations that, that directly address those. So I think the, the mandate is now out there to reduce animal use in, in drug development, testing and, and approval. And so I think it's worth spending time, you know, as, as stakeholders in this process to, you know, really try to come up with, with leading examples that could, um, you know, sort of demonstrate that animal-free approach, um, be effective, be insightful, um, and meet the regulatory requirements. But I, I think, I think it, it requires leadership, right, in that area to determine solid objectives, achievable objectives. Yeah, I mean, I think they're, they're definitely the pharmaceutical industry has a strong push to move ever more towards use, using human models, particularly ones that are, you know, really effective at capturing uh, human physiology. And so, again, you know, I think what both Stuart and Christine said, you know, the validation component is important. And as pharmaceutical companies are putting forward uh, to the FDA these uh, their safety packages uh, as they as they contain more and more of data that's based on organ on chip or on these 3D models that uh, Dr. Mumry described, uh, these organoid uh, multicellular models that can be used for high throughput screening, as that becomes more accepted, I think you'll see it's going to be a you know a, a, an amplification within the pharmaceutical industry. They're going to get more confidence. FDA is going to get more confidence. They're going to be more broadly used. Having said that, I think that's still a process and animal models won't go away anytime soon. So, yeah. Yeah, so we did actually try with that Dr. Dr. Rubicin variant yeah. to go to the FDA with the Aclarubicin. Um, and they were very interested. So we got identical results in mice and in the human micro tissue models. Um, but they didn't con convert into them saying we didn't have to do 100 rabbits as well. <laughs> 
and we know pretty sure the same thing will come out, but we still have to do it. So they they still got cold feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think to that point, that's a perfect example. Um, there's going to be some, I guess, bridging activities um, to be done to increase the confidence in using uh, non-animal models. Um, but at this point, I think it's really a kind of a two-pronged approach, um, improving our non-animal models to reduce the reliance on animals, um, but then also to um, those who work uh, primarily in animals for their studies, um, improving animal study reporting standards and development um, of what works and what doesn't work, that will also kind of help um, in our use of animals and be more kind of conscious of it. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to now turn a little bit. We, we don't have a, a great deal of time left, but I'd like to turn. I think this is really important. One or two of you alluded to this. Um, is academic industry partnerships. Um, you're all involved in this type of relationship. And I think that there's, in some cases, there's still this reluctance or uh, feeling that it's difficult, impossible, or um, even selling out in some cases I've heard, um, um, which I don't agree with, but I'd like to hear your, your, your point about um, your points and your experience with academic industry partnerships and, and the benefits really of, of doing that. So we'll start again with uh, Christine. Yes, so um, I also uh, formed a spin out called uh, Encardia, and it was entirely focused on producing cardiomyocytes and doing screening for toxicity. It worked out extremely well, um, and they've now moved on to being doing drug discovery. Uh, but we could never, as academics, really implement this by ourselves. Um, the, the advantage for academics is they have freedom to do one thing one day and the next thing the other day, providing you can get funding and companies have to deliver. So more like a CRO. But on the other hand, without companies to do the due diligence, to do the reproducibility testing, um, we won't get there. And uh, the, the robotic systems you need to do it uh, really um, are something an industry does better than an academic environment. So, I mean, most um, penny people are, you know, co-sponsored often by industry. In fact, in the Netherlands, many grants uh, and in the EU in, EU in general, they require collaboration with companies to make sure that discoveries are translated to something usable in the public domain. Um, and in the US, many, many people have their own company or spin outs or whatever the big Pharma companies are often founded by scientists, uh, but it's not the convention in Europe to do that. Okay, Stuart, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I think um, we sort of, it, it's natural and um, also I think very important to try to strive, the, strive to bridge the gap between industry and academics. Um, both have really unique, uh, but different resources, capabilities, and um, you know potential. And I have learned a lot in the in the last few years, sort of working more directly with industry, gaining a perspective that, frankly, as an academic, I, I didn't have at all. So um, I sort of see those three things coming together: academic scientists, clinicians, and industry partners. Um, when you can kind of bring all three into the mix, your perspective really changes. We have the opportunity to then um, harness our knowledge uh, and experience to make a difference. And um, mm -hmm. so I, I think on a lot of levels, it's, it's very important. I would just say even our trainees academically, we know that the vast majority are not going to go on to academic positions. They're headed into industry. And so I also feel like it's an obligation uh, as, as a mentor and as somebody who trains new scientists to um, have some familiarity with that. So on, on a lot of levels, I, I think it's uh, important. It elevates the science, it elevates the therapies, and uh, I'm very committed to that, that idea. Yeah, I would say, yeah, I've had experience um, in multiple ways. Um, one very beneficial, you know, way is for pharmaceutical companies to fund research in our lab. We learn a lot about what's important to them, what the model has to have as attributes to address, you know, some of their mechanistic studies. And that's really propelled our fundamental science and our, our sort of bioengineering uh, toolbox, if you will. 
Uh, we've licensed IP to to companies uh, that are doing you know drug screening uh, and the like, and then we've also and also organ uh, tissue engineering. And then I you know I've sort of as a co-founder and I definitely agree that it is a, a real eye-opening experience to see you know sticking to, to milestones and, and the kinds of resources that can be brought to bear on problems, uh, things that probably wouldn't be as well done in, in an academic setting. So I find, you know, all flavors of academic industry partnerships to be extremely exciting and valuable. And I think at the end of the day, translating the work um, and really having an impact on society is hugely important. So I, I, I'm, a, I'm definitely a, a fan of, of, of this on all levels. Darren? Oh, uh, yeah, no, this is all just well said by my fellow panel members. Um, this is a very valuable thing to have academic industry partnerships that really do help advance our science and uh, hopefully um, can develop new therapeutics around a disease. Uh, before, before we move on uh, to the question and answer session, I just have one question that I, I, I see a reluctance in a lot of people um, to patent their discoveries because they think that they will not get disseminated um, if they do that and they need to be shared, etc. cetera. I, I have quite strong feelings on this, but I, um, because I, I think um, if, you, if you don't patent your invention, the likelihood of it being taken up and used um, uh, by industry or by pharma is, is minimal. And so you're likely to have the opposite effect. But I just wonder if anybody has any thoughts on advice of, of when and when to patent, when not to patent your, your discovery. So, Christine, we'll start with you again. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's a difficult question. Um, I think as academics, we're not always very good at recognizing something that is patentable. At least I'm not. And my group isn't either. Um, so we try to patent, for example, vitronectin as a substrate for uh, pluripotent stem cells and we were the first to discover it um, and when I said well couldn't we patent it the patent lawyer said no 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 it's obvious okay but then the moment we published it a company uh, started producing it and everybody grows their cells on, on vitronectin on the other hand um, when you do patent something it does delay the publishing process and some of our researchers are very dependent on their publication to move forward to their next job um, so that makes it a little, little bit of a dilemma sometimes. Depends how your tech transfer office deals with it. Are they efficient? There are some wonderful tech transfer offices that really get it together, and others take years before they've actually decided you can actually talk about this at a meeting. So mm -hmm. I'm not really quite sure what the best thing to do is. No. Any other thoughts on that before we move on to question and answers? Anybody have anything they'd like to add? I think it's a discussion that, w that we need to have. And I'd just like to point out that patent and patents are just the other side of the Atlantic, right? So a patent <laughs> is English and a patent is American. <laughs> um, okay. All right. So uh, thank you so much for the discussion. And I think that we'll hand it over to the question and answer session. I believe that Sarah, you're going to um, take over the, because you have the list of, of questions that have been. Yes. Before, right? I Yes, I will. Thank you so much for that, Dennis. Um, and great discussion, everyone. Um, really great topics um, and important to discuss. So we do have a, a couple questions in here, but um, before I address the first one, I just want to remind the audience, if you do have questions for our lovely panelists, um, please put them in that Q&A tab and we'll get to as many as we can in the next about eight minutes. <laughs> um, so the first question that we have here um, is what is the name of the HTS platform to look at calcium dynamics using um, iPSCs? So that, that was the question to me, I think, and it's the Hamamatsu. So it's a commercial system. It's quite uh, widely used and it's uh, very efficient, very quick. Fantastic, great. Um, we've got another question here. Have any of your labs used um, these models to study impaired healing? For example, have you physically injured the organoid and then observed regeneration? So I'll, I'll start with you, Stuart. So that's not something we've um, directly tried. We have um, probably the closest thing we've done to that is actually use diseased extracellular matrix from um, 
a pig model of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which I, I thought was very interesting. Um, you know, we, we found that healthy cells grown on, on this diseased matrix, decellularized matrix, actually manifest some of the same uh, phenotypes as the cardiomyopathy mutation carrying lines. Um, but we, we really haven't looked at, at in vitro regeneration or, or healing. Um, Darren, I'm just going to move because you're next on my screen. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think uh, for these systems, it's, it's an added layer of complexity. I think um, something that I've wondered um, in the background of some sort of genetic cardiomyopathy, um, I'd just be curious if any of the other panel members have tried simulating some sort of environmental stimulus that would, you know, make this underlying cardiomyopathy more predisposed to showing disease. Mm -hmm. And Jennifer? We have not yet, but I think uh, one of the advantages of our SWIFT printing platform is that instead of just printing vascular channels, we can come down and print features that maybe contain uh, disease car uh, building blocks or, um, you know, adipose rich building blocks to, to, to emulate like a fatty uh, myocardium. So I think there are ways to use these very complex uh tools to, to generate um, models that might have quite a high impact in, in studying disease um, or damaged tissues. One could imagine creating a, 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 a region that's devoid of, of any type of, of cell and then think, looking at how healing might happen across that, across that gap as well. Mm -hmm. And then Christine, I know you guys do this. Yeah, so, uh, well, we, we do it partly. Um, so many groups use uh, of doing this type of work use cryo-injury models, and some groups use um, hypoxia modules. Um, there's also the uh, genetic models you could see, see for, say, for example. Uh, we induce fibrosis uh, using TGF-beta type of approaches. Um, then we can decide whether we affect the fibroblasts or the cardiomyocytes to some extent. Um, and infl inflammatory signals, so adding inflammatory cytokines and inflammatory cells. So not directly, let's say, an infarct as such, that's rather more difficult, but there are various ways to mimic aspects of disease or pathologies, I would say. Fantastic. Okay, we've got a couple more questions here. So this next one is, um, how feasible or useful is CRISPR in the efficient generation of these disease models? Um, I, I mean, I can start out on that one. Um, we have used CRISPR-Cas9 extensively to introduce cardiomyopathy mutations into IPS cell lines. And, you know, I consider that to be a, an important tool um, just in the last year or so, we've had our first publications come out with that. But um, yeah, very powerful, really exciting application. Yeah, so we, we've done the same. Um, so the conceptually, the two different things. You can have uh, a cell from a, from a patient, correct, correct the mutation in the iPS cells, and you have isogenic pairs. The alternative is that you make an allelic series on a single iPS line that you know has no variants associated with cardiac disease, because if it's you know, got some variants already, you may get mislead yourself. But if you want to make a lot, it's very hard to make a lot of IPS lines from a lot of patients. So you have to decide what your question is primarily. Um, and the nice thing about you know, sort of having series of mutation, if you have an iron channel gene, you can make mutations in the paw region or the tail region, any way you like, and figure out what uh, disease severity outcomes there are on a single line, because you've got all the controls. Uh, you can also in introduce upstream mutations, uh, variants of unknown uh, significance into these models. So, uh, but of course, a lot of people want to know if an individual patient is susceptible to a condition. So uh, you have to really think about your question. CRISPR goes very fast. We've actually developed a new method, which is making it even faster, it's called straight in. So we can get um, a whole series of uh, lines within a, you know, four or five weeks, and we can put in large payloads. So we can combine these with reporter systems as well. So there are lots of things one can do, and I think the world is just sort of opening up to the options here. Fantastic. 
Great. All right. Uh, I've got a couple more questions here. So this next question is directed at you, Dr. Mumry. Um, you talked about the need for better modeling of aging and fibrosis. Are we missing the genomic fingerprint of it or the extracellular cues? For example, ECM, hypoxia, et cetera. Hmm. Yeah, if we knew that, we'd be able to solve it. Um, I, can, I can only say I was extremely impressed by a recent talk of uh, Lauren Studer, who's done some very nice work looking at uh, maturation and aging of neurons published recently. I think it might still be on BioArchive. I'm not sure whether it's out yet. But that was very encouraging that you could actually do it for neurons. So why not? If we understand more about the aged heart, we will understand a lot more about which genes are involved, which proteins, epigenetic mechanisms, and the extracellular signals that might be involved. It's quite hard uh, for basic scientists to access aged heart, um, but if we could, we may you know, obtain the vital clues for this. So there's a lot of basic research uh, needed doing to address that. We can do fibrosis uh, to some extent, um, but uh, the rest we don't know a lot about. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Okay. Um, we've got time for at least one more question here. So I'm going to jump to that. Um, what challenges do you face when trying to decide what media formulation to use when you culture multiple cell types all together? And what have been your solutions? So maybe I'll kick off again. Um, so are we luck lucky for the heart that the media formulations are rather similar? Um, it's not like the liver where they're extremely different, the different cell types. But um, we tend to use, let's say, if we've got two cell types, we use 50-50 of their favorite medium or a third, a third, a third if you've got three cell types. And generally, it works pretty well. So we haven't had major problems, luckily. Someone else want to jump in on that? I don't have anything to add. That's, that's our strategy too. Okay, great. All right, I'm gonna take one last question here because we are approaching um, the end of the webinar. So this last question is, uh, can you incorporate innervation into your model system since this is an important heart function? Yes, we can. So you, what you want to innovate, you want the parasympathetic and sympathetic nerves to go into the heart tissues. Um, we can do that quite well now with primary uh, neurons, and we're working on it for iPS-derived neurons. Um, but certainly, after myocardial infarction, patients do get hyperinnovation, and one of the treatments is actually to cut the nerves. So if we could find a mechanism uh, to inhibit that, would be very, very helpful in the clinic. We think nerve growth factors involved, but uh, there are probably a lot of other factors as well. Anybody else want to add anything there? Okay, fantastic. Um, we are right at the end of our session today. I wanted to take this time uh, to thank you all so much for your expertise and um, being here with us to share your work and um, all of your insights. So really was a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We hope that you enjoyed this Inside Scientific webinar made possible by Cytokinetics and produced in partnership with the American Physiological Society. And we hope that you enjoy the rest of your day.